everything occurs in the presence of its opposite, and out of that there is generated the friction, the heat, and the light that all comes together in an indissoluble package as part of life. Part, I said. Part, walk into the gold vaults of the nations, into the secrets of kings, into the holy of holies. Power to make multitudes run squealing in terror at the touch of my little invisible finger. Even the moon frightened of me, frightened to death. The whole world frightened to death. All right. Good morning. Good afternoon or good evening, everybody. We are back once again with the Elemental Philosophorum series. And we are back, of course, joined with our great friend of the show, Mark from Ultimedia United and the My Family Thinks I'm Crazy podcast. Brother, how you doing today? I'm doing good, man. I'm excited to get into hydrogen. I think I mentioned this in the last episode. It's a very, very important element. <laughs> Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Uh, today, as Mark just said, we will be covering hydrogen, which again, many of you may have noticed that we sort of wanted to focus on the more sort of, you know, push to the side elements, if you want to call it, that a lot of people don't really know as much about and things like that leading up to the main elements, such as what we're doing today. So Mark, brother, would you want to take it away to to start her off and then we'll we'll continue from there? Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, thanks again. For joining me, brother, it's a pleasure to do this show with you and for your your audience and mine. And I think one day we might we might evolve this show into something where it's like a paywall show. So while you're at it, folks, get in on the ground floor, support both of us. We both have Patreons. We both have ways to support the show and Rockfin as well where we are about to stream live. I'm always so bad with this and I, <laughs> I forget to do it until we're halfway in and then people like join into a conversation without an intro. So shout out to the 10 or so people who are supporting me on Rockfin despite my unpreparedness. But yes, here we are with hydrogen. And, you know, as I said, it's very important. It's pivotal to just physical chemistry in general you know the world around us comprises of a great degree of hydrogen it's the most abundant element in the world scientists say so take that for what you will but you know as it pertains to our interests it connects to a lot of different things i mean obviously the hydrogen bomb changed the world literally and you know considering what we were talking about with lithium you consider that lithium was a, you know, kind of inextricable part of the hydrogen bomb process. I thought that this would be an interesting next step to go since we covered lithium already after taking a little diversion into cobalt. And hydrogen, obviously the name water genus forming, water forming. The name, because when it was discovered, they realized, oh, it's a part of hydrogen, you know, H2O, hydrogen oxide, what we would call water, obviously something very important to us human beings. But at the time when hydrogen was discovered, you know, they didn't really have all that many uses for it. And one of the kind of major uses for it that really led into it being used in the military in general was its use as a gas balloon propel propellant, right? Because it's right. the lightest element next to helium. So they were able to use this hydrogen to fill up weather balloons and, and even espionage balloons. They had like all sorts of different ideas for what they would use these balloons for. And then eventually people know hydrogen began began being used as rocket fuel supposedly we're told nasa uses it as rocket fuel but also it was absolutely 100 percent a part of the manhattan project right and the detonating of the atom bomb right so, so okay we're crossing a lot of fields here and, and and again it's something that's all around us and it's one of the elements that's hard to categorize you know it's some some periodic table of elements will have it at the beginning of the elemental you know table because it's sort of like the progenitor 
of all the other elements considering you know it only has one proton right so that's how we get the atomic number we're counting the number of protons in this atomic structure that is an element and hydrogen obviously is the first element so whether that means hydrogen came first i mean to me i think that you know the the big bang stuff isn't exactly my flavor of how i explain the origins of the universe but i have heard that that's a big degree what scientists speculate is that hydrogen was a big part of that so that's kind of my best attempt at a beating around the bush basic intro to hydrogen from my stoner perspective but what do you have to to share about hydrogen brother okay so you actually covered a lot of different things that i really appreciate because that'll segue into a few different things i'm looking at here so First and foremost, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I believe it was called the Proje hold on, the Project Rainbow Theory Stern. Let me actually share my screen with everybody just so. Okay, one second here. All right, perfect. This is fantastic. Now, allegedly, I want to be very clear about this. I, off the top of my head, I had not planned to bring this up, but you had brought in a great segue that I couldn't not uh, mention it. Apparently, uh, you can all see my screen here, CERN scientist set to make contact. Yep. Okay. We see here inventorspot.com, CERN scientist set to make contact with parallel universe with large hadron collider. Now, interestingly enough, again, let's uh, put this to the side with respects to the parallel universe angle. And I say that because it's been proposed that the CERN uh, rainbow theory, if you will, or the rainbow experiment, I also believe there's other uh, documents that substantiate this too. They, as a matter of fact, help substantiate the rainbow universe proposal that sort of pushes to the side the Big Bang aspect, if you want to call it. So we see here, and I quote, the most widely accepted theory is that in the beginning there was a singularity. And then at some point, according to modern mathematics, around almost 14 billion years ago, an event known as the Big Bang occurred. Space and time were created in this moment, along with a finite amount of energy and matter in a very dense state. Again, going back to the concentric circles, the bubbles, the plasma pockets relative to Dan Winter's work. But putting that aside, we see here, but what if the math is wrong and the universe is older than we think? Physicists and scientists using the compact muon solenoid detector at CERN in Geneva, Switzerland, apparently stumbled upon evidence that this might be true in a recent accident during the Large Hadron Collider's warm-up on March 20th. General, according to Jessica uh, Cerniski, a CERN physicist, a general-purpose detector picked up irregular data and determined that they had created a rainbow universe. She added that rainbow universes such as the one accidentally created in their tests had only been speculated to exist in the past. There is solid mathematics to back it up, however. Rainbow universes are thought to be a natural result of gravity affected by different wavelengths of light and the theory behind it, while unproven at this point, attempts to fill the gaps between quantum mechanics and relativity. Now, again, we see here that if we continue on, again, you know, this connects to different, you know, apparatuses all around the world, you name it. But interestingly enough, all right, we'll see here, and I quote, one of the more startling points of interest found in the data from the accident at CERN when compiled into three dimensions was the outline of a ghostly dolphin-like creature. While it was originally thought to have been residual bleed from a nearby computer screen, analyzation of the data revealed that it is apparently real. Okay, it will force the scientific community to rethink its current position on the origins of the universe as we know it, more than likely causing the idea of a singularity-based Big Bang to be thrown out, end quote. Now, that doesn't rule out the possibility of a quantum entangled-based Big Bang, presuming I understand this correctly. Now, People might say, okay, you know, Dave, you just read us this whole thing. What does this have to do with, you know, hydrogen and all of that? Well, let's take a look over here. If we jump to uh, lindirect.com, uh, lind I believe it is. What are argon and hydrogen gas blends? The Lind Hydrostar shielding gas blends are primarily used for joining ostentic, ostentic, uh, ostentic, excuse me, stainless steels using the gas tungsten arc welding or gtaw process austenitic stainless steels uh there we go austenitic thank you hydrogen increases heat input to the base materials while providing a reducing atmosphere to enhance weld cleanliness 
significant advantages in travel speed over pure argon can be attained, end quote. So, the question then becomes, okay, why is this brought up? First off, let's just mention that we recently covered tungsten, right? We then have, you know, tungsten here. And in addition to that, we see as well the combination of the gas tungsten arc welding, all right, which reminds me of particle beam welding, okay? And not only that, but at the same time, we can refer this to back to what Bob Lazar, again, think of him as he will, but when he claimed specifically the Project Looking Glass device used an argon-type gas in correspondence with hydrogen. And depending on the, the angles in which you turned this device, it could be used as not only a stargate or a portal, if you will, a teleportation device, but also as something that could be viewed as viewing events of the past or events that may occur in the future as well. So essentially, that's what I've gathered from this. Again, these are not sources that are connected, which well, makes me think, again, that there is something there that is being suppressed, but sorry. No, I mean, this is, this is just like a little flabbergasting for me, and I hope the connection comes through lucidly for you and the audience. When I was looking into this, and, and you just brought up kind of hydrogen, and it's really strange property, right? in this example and there are numerous examples and you know when it comes to hydrogen being this sort of creation connected to creation somehow it reminded me of what i was reading from a what joseph farrell describes as a unsung genius of the 20th century nikolai kozirev who discovered a new kind of physical interaction and development of an original scientific picture of the world in which the passage of time appears as a physical process that ensures the maintenance of life in the universe. According to his theory, celestial bodies, both planets and stars, are machines that produce energy and time serves as the raw material for processing. By virtue of its special physical properties, it is able to prolong the activity and viability of an object. The no the longer an object exists, the more it acquires the ability to continue to exist. So he stumbled upon this while discovering that there are some weird anomalies with the hydrogen bombs when they were creating these hydrogen bombs in Germany and the United States. Okay, before you go on, brother, that is, I, I'm so, so glad you brought that up. And I say that because this ties in perfectly with this right here. So we just covered argon and hydrogen gas for those watching or listening. We then had Mark just describe that to us. Now, interestingly enough, let's take a look at this right here. Chemical elements, images of these elements. This is hydrogen, right? We're seeing right here. What does this potentially remind us of in a visual sense? In my perspective, a few different things. What we see here is again, that toroidal field. Okay, right. that's, that Dan Winter brings up of plasma intelligence, that whole angle. We also have to consider the fact that apparently, and I'm, I say this because I don't know this for certain, but apparently our solar system relative to our planet, our, our family of planets orbiting around the sun are moving in the same depiction and direction in the sense of it's moving and allegedly all of our planets are orbiting around the sun, but moving in a linear fashion while the planets are orbiting around the sun. Therefore, again, gives that same visual right. of the hydrogen symbol. Again, the Tesla coil, right? We look up the Tesla coil with the rings and it's the exact same thing, for example, right? Um, and you're talking, you know, all of this without knowing that the guy I just mentioned is the inventor of torsion weights for Aether research. So he was actually doing research on toroid fields when postulating this and oh my god wow okay so all right when i look at that can you go to the one on the top row to the right the fifth one to the, the yes click that and so when people see the way this works right and if you're watching on the video you can see that there's sort of like a donut shaped grid and the graph is showing the movement from the interior to the exterior and like looping back right if you can imagine all bodies in space operating like this, right? So the sun is essentially creating this process of, you know, whatever's going on with the hydrogen that they tried to mimic with the hydrogen bomb, right? This reaction. And our earth is doing the same thing, which connects 
in a whole other tangent, which we won't get into right away. Maybe we could touch on it later. But the way the Earth works, and I read a theory that the South Pole and the North Pole, just like in this toroid field where we're seeing here, the South Pole is store is sort of growing outward right so land is generated from the south pole and then in the north pole it kind of gets like inverted into the core and then back out of the bottom which you know maybe the earth's hollow maybe not but that there's definitely some truth to that can i add as well that if, to a few different things here what we're seeing here for those watching visually that toroidal field not only is it allegedly the energetic field that human bodies project it's also what walter russell proposed in his a book, The Universal One, that is how the planet works. And not just that, that's also how right. Dan Winter, and again, you know, Michael Sal, you, you name it, discusses, you know, John Hutchinson, the Hutchinson effect, the spiral, again, going back to the Fibonacci sequence, the spiral at the top, how it's self imploding. And Dan Winter has a great little, I guess, you, I don't want to say the word toy, but I guess prop, if you will, that describes this exactly right here. And in addition to all of that, this is apparently the same concept of, that would corroborate Agartha, inner Earth, if the planet and all planets were to be established in this type of way, right? So you have that. And then you have, like you said, the toroidal fields. And what was that gentleman? What was he? the Dr. Nikolai Koryev or Kor Koz Kozirev, K-O-Z-Y-R-E-V. Uh, okay. He invented torsion weights for aether research. He was an astrophysicist and doctor of physico-mathematical sciences. And also, if I could mention, this is also, I sorry, I forgot. This is how Dr. Eric Davis and Hal Puda have proposed uh, traversable wormholes would work, theoretically. Wow. And, apparent, and again, to corroborate that, Staff Sergeant Clifford Stone had claimed in, back in 2006 in an interview with Project Camelot, 2006 or 7, that these beings, a lot of, in a lot of cases, not in all, but in most cases, use what's called traversable wormholes to get across vast distances. Very. We can also substantiate that with Frederick Porti's recent leak of the uh, DIA's radar alien hunting binoculars as well. So there's that too. I mean, there's so many, so many things that corroborate this, not just this visual, but the science behind it as well. I mean, it, we just covered a whole spectrum of individuals not evidently related to one another. And it all seems to stem back to this visual depiction of the toroidal field. And this is a, definitely a through line in the show. I mean, I can't recall the names of the gentlemen you just mentioned, but you do mention them often. So yes, it's very, it's very much a through line. I'm glad to see it connects, but it's inevitably going to connect with hydrogen. Going back to the topic at hand, you know, hydrogen is everywhere, literally. So right absolutely and absolutely. what's interesting is there was a new state of matter identified in hydrogen so they put hydrogen under mind-boggling pressures as this article from live science describes and they created an entirely new state of matter called phase v hydrogen this squished hydrogen is a precursor to a state of matter first proposed in the 1930s called atomic solid metallic hydrogen when cooled to low enough temperatures hydrogen which on earth is usually found as a gas can become a solid at high enough pressures when the element solidifies it turns into a metal Planetary scientists think the interior of Jupiter is largely made of this stuff. And so, in crushing hydrogen at such high pressures, the physicists also got a glimpse of the inner atmosphere of a gas giant. Now, what I just said, folks, might sound like scientific boggledy, kind of crazy if you're not, you know, into this mindset of physics. But from the alchemical perspective, what we're talking about here is quite literally from my you know, armchair judgment, the philosopher's stone. I mean, if you go back to the study of the elements and the alchemy, it was all about where are these elements coming from. And one of the big ideas that really grew around alchemy was that, you know, all of the things that we see in our physical, natural world are components, you know, they're made up of the same components, fire, water, air, earth seem, and space seem to be like these opposing forces and what we're seeing in hydrogen is possibly all of those possibilities in one element. And I think is extremely telling 
when you consider that they blew up all this hydrogen, right, in this extremely interesting period in the middle of the 20th century, and everything that followed that was extremely weird. We're talking UFO sightings, we're talking the hippie drug culture, we're talking modern media, technology, the internet, we're talking high tech, you know, the Jetsons, everybody thought that was going to be the future. Well, it's more like 1984, and it all kind of stems back to, you know, that period and beyond in other ways, but that period specifically seems to be extremely important. You know, World War II, obviously political and on a physical level, but with these bombs, I mean, they were literally playing around with the fabric of the universe. Right, and that's interesting as well too, because again, this will, I'm just gonna share my screen real quickly. This will uh, bring everything full circle uh, to what you were saying too, I hope, uh, brother, because Apparently, when these aliens came to visit human leaders and all that and say, look, when you when you drop the hydrogen bomb, it messes with quantum entanglement because I just finished actually doing an episode where it's discussed that uh, I believe I don't want to put words in Mr. Elizondo's mouth, but I believe it was Lou Elizondo that said that think of a cigarette and the cherry of a burning cigarette or, a you know, a joint for weed, whatever it is. And notice how the cherry, multiple parts of the cherry are constantly burning. Oh, perfect. Mark's actually lighting one right now, it seems. And notice how different points of the cherry are burning. They're happening constantly at the same time. Apparently, dropping or splitting the atom, dropping the hydrogen bomb, created a major issue within quantum entanglement that has to do with implosion and phase conjugation physics that directly factors in hydrogen. Now, I'm not trying to uh, bring up Mr. Dan Winter's work, but when you type in phase hydrogen uh, conjugation, his work does appear. His work does, in fact, appear. So we see here again, going back to the toroidal field, we see these different connections of that angle of self implosion, which also reminds us of, again, the double helix in the DNA, the holy grail of fusion and implosion. Also, you said the philosopher's stone. It's, it's, it's actually incredible you brought that up, brother, because Dan Winter was on our show a little while back and he mentioned, if I'm not mistaken, in literal terms uh, and verbal usage, the philosopher's stone. Right. So now we see, for example, over here, mysteriousuniverse.org. New theory suggests that Oumuamua may be a hydrogen iceberg. All right. This was, again, that cigar shaped craft that, or I mean, Oumuamua. Oumuamua. That's, that's how you, there we go. That Avi Loeb from the Galileo project, the Harvard astronomer, you know, tried to sort of bring into the, into the forefront of, of space uh, discussion. We then see, for example, over here, sorry, one second, the uh, uh, ufonut.com, not exactly a mainstream media website, alien hydrogen hypothesis. Okay. And the reason for this is because again, and I quote, one of my recent posts, hydrogen, do aliens like it by Chuck Sikowski? I touched on my hypothesis that aliens are using hydrogen resources here on earth. Is it used for their propulsion? Not sure, but it appears a lot of my sighting investigations are near sources of hydrogen. Water or H2O contains one oxygen and two hydrogen atoms, so there's plenty of hydrogen there. But hydrogen can be extracted from other sources too, one being fossil fuels. It is found in natural forms like hydrocarbons, which are found in coal, petroleum, natural gas, all of that, right? What is interesting is hydrogen really doesn't exist in abundance in our atmosphere. NASA states the gases in Earth's atmosphere include nitrogen 78%, oxygen 21%, argon 0.93%, carbon dioxide 0.04% and then some trace amounts of neon, helium, methane, krypton, and hydrogen, end quote. Before we go on, again, going back to the argon, the argon gas mixing in with hydrogen relative to Bob Lazar's claims of, you know, argon and the project looking glass. And then if we jump on over here to ancient-code.com, element 115 that Bob Lazar has so famously, you know, put on the map, so to speak, infamous alien element, and I quote, mentioned over a decade ago, in Area 51 added to the periodic table right now. <laughs> wow. There, there's, I mean, again, people can, you know, speculate and criticize, like, you know, George Knapp, Bob Lazar, as we see here. And again, I totally understand that. And it's very healthy to be skeptical. But what we cannot deny is the statements of these elements being working in conjunction with one another based on eyewitness testimony, or again, such as Bob Lazar allegedly, but then to have it corroborated in certain articles in modern day, again, commercial solutions, if you will, such as what we see here. Again, such as what we see, for example, in Wired. Before we go too far uh, east of where we just were, 
Can I just point out two things? First of all, sure. yeah. un unpentium seems like a very <laughs> interesting name for an element. I don't just from my like brief etymological stuff that I do from time to time with the help of all the really cool folks in the telegram. Un un, right? We have a double negative. That's kind of interesting, kind of like collapsing in on itself, almost a snake biting its tail. Un un. And then we have pent, which means five, right? Pent, pentagram, penta. So that's five, which, you know, maybe we're talking about a uh, pentagram there. Who knows? But pentium, I don't know. Un, un, penta, pentium seems like a very alchemical name for an element. And then the other thing I wanted to bring up is that point about hydrogen, because, yeah, I probably spoke a little bit out of uh, the truth there by accident when I said that hydrogen was absolutely everywhere. But, you know, thank you for, for clarifying, first of all. But then second of all, when you consider the number of USOs in, you know, next to UFOs, you find out that there are a lot of really maybe even ancient stories of unidentified submersible objects seems like that was more balanced. Now we have a really prolific amount of UFOs, but then again, you know, it could be just as many USOs going on. One thing that comes to mind is the whole Nomo story from the Dogon people who, you know, obviously, I don't know. I mean, that that's a little bit out of my realm to go into all the facts, but the, the, the fact that these people in ancient times knew about a, you know, about Sirius B, which is blind, even, you know, you can't see it by the human, human eye. They didn't have telescopes. So, I mean, the fact that they also say that they're, you know, these beings that taught them this came from underwater. To me, it just points back to this whole theme of aliens being underwater, having underwater bases and going to what you just brought up needing to be in the water for whatever reason because there's an abundance of hydrogen there it makes sense like why would you use something completely rare to you know propel your craft that would be kind of illogical if you go to a planet like earth and you can run your craft using water it seems like it would make a lot of sense i wonder if ufos are seen when you know there's rainy days or something, or maybe they like fly through clouds to like get water from the clouds. <laughs> I, I love that you said that. So this is what I want to make uh, connections to, to add to that, to what you just said. So let me share my screen here for the audience. So heading back to ufonut.com. All right. So if aliens, and I quote, needed vast amounts of hydrogen, this directly addresses what you just said, brother, for propulsion or personal use and can't get it from our atmosphere, where do they go? They can go to water for one right? Because it covers 71% of the earth and our underground water storage holds three times as much as our ocean. So we have a lot of it. Now, hydrogen here on earth, okay, can also, excuse me, sorry, can also be created from natural resources. We'll get to that in a second. However, what we'll find here is that, so is there another resource where aliens can get hydrogen? Yes. Hydrogen is also the most abundant element in space. Stars like our sun consist mostly of hydrogen. And in a recent article from NASA, it appears there's more hydrogen in space than we once thought. Okay, end quote. Now, interestingly enough, hydrogen, stars like our sun consist mostly of hydrogen. So we got that, right? Okay, now take a look at this right over here. So we see stars like our sun consist mostly of hydrogen. Boom. Here are some pictures, some photographs of alleged craft using the sun to feed off for energy. There's videos of it. It's all over the internet. And I mean, when you look at something like this, it's just, I don't know at this point, uh, you know, again, assuming the photographs are not altered, the, the metadata behind them substantiates and ascertains the veracity of it. I mean, just look again and again, you got one craft over here, for example, feeding off of the sun. You have another one here that seems to be using a laser to feed off of the sun. Right, this this instance right here. We also have this one here. This circle, by the way, folks, is the sun. This would be a craft. We have then as well this photo right over here. This one on the left, and then we have the one on the right. So clearly, I mean, again, not for anything, but we also have ancient uh, scriptures and cave drawings. And, and for drawings. people listening, I mean, you if you you know aren't on Rockfin, definitely get on Rockfin and check this out. But the pictures to describe what we're seeing kind of 
streaking by the sun looks I mean, metallic, it kind of even looks like there's windows on the thing in that one picture. But there's this clear like structure of almost like it, you could imagine maybe wings or a disc shaped object moving, you know, sort of fast by when they're taking this camera. So there's like a, a displacement of light where the, you know, movement is. Cause it kind of looks like if you caught a bird flying by your camera, like a shadow of a bird, you know, like, but yeah, you know, take that for what you will. It could just be like some kind of plasmic force flowing by the sun. I mean, the sun is still unexplained to a large degree in my opinion, but I'm not an expert. Right. Looks like there's well, mountains on the sun. If that's really the sun, I mean, wow. <laughs> right. Well, see, right. This is the craft right here, allegedly feeding off of the sun. Right. And then watch, it will disappear almost in like a tentacle like way. Seems to be feeding, feeding, or, you know, harvesting. Interesting. Okay. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Like there's this energy trail going back from the sun to the, like they get close enough and this sort of force happens and then they float away. Maybe they get charged up and pushed away just in time not to, you know, completely get destroyed. But I imagine they'd have to have some sort of maybe even a hydrogen like metal uh, as their, you know, metal to make a craft like that that's flying close to the sun if the sun is as hot as they tell us it is who knows maybe it's you know maybe it works in a different way but not yeah. only that too but we also have for example drawings cave drawings of i'm going to see if i can pull it up now i should have my apologies i should have prepared ahead of time but of the sun being used as a portal sun portal drawings here we go should be one second ah here we are perfect okay take a look at this folks we see here very quick, let me share my screen. So we see, for example, I can't, please forgive me. I should have been more uh, well versed on this, but off the top of my head, I don't remember where this particular ancient object is from, but we see here again, this object representing the sun or this drawing here, these representing the craft. And we can presume it's the sun because again, the depiction of this dark spot on this alleged drawing of the sun is identical to that of what we know to be in modern day this part i don't know any of the scientific terms for this so i'm not going to pretend like i do but for those watching visually you see the connection and it's been written down in ancient scriptures in the literature that has not been analyzed or acknowledged by the rockefeller the smithsonian you name it that the sun was used as a portal in a lot of cases for these craft to come and go in in some instances in ancient human history so again seemingly like a relative to that of like the Bermuda Triangle. There's some strange anomalies, but again, you know, when people say, oh, how, how come we can't go investigate? Oh, well, the sun's too hot. Okay, well, that's that sort of closes the case. It's as if we don't have tech that can get close to it. And I know that's a bit of a stretch. A lot of people say, Dave, it's real hot. So, and I, I say, yes, I get it. But if we, again, if we jump back to the concept of phase conjugation by Dan Winter, even many others too, and the toroidal field, you would be creating a bubble around the craft that void space and time so the heat would not affect it so you'd then be able to do what we saw uh, over here where the excuse me where the craft could feed off of the sun in a way that would not damage the craft it seems again ufo mothership with force field sucking plasma now so from that same logic and i mean i'm really just thinking off the top of my head here considering that this book that i got the information i haven't even started reading it yet but it's called the grid of the gods by joseph uh, p farrell and scott d hart oxford educated authors so you know they're not your typical conspiracy theorists here but they're book is very much about pyramids so i'm wondering to that same logic what if pyramids operate in a similar way pulling energy from the sun and if i can go into the scientist that we mentioned before the dr kozrev kozirev he talks about torsion and obviously and his explanation for it maybe this will connect with what you're talking about with dan winter maybe not i am again kind of like a chimpanzee learning how to fly a spaceship talking about this stuff but we're doing our best here folks not, not at all brother <laughs> If you didn't bring up what you, all the all of the elements and the other angles of this, I would not have had those ideas come to me. So please, by all means. Well, thank you. So, 
Kozirev's answer, and I'm reading this again from The Grid of the Gods, Kozirev's answer forms one of the major themes of this book, Torsion. It was a, if time was a source of stellar energy, then like all forms of energy, it had a definite shape or structure, a pattern. Kozirev put it, a pattern that was moreover spiral and rotating in nature. This is exactly what torsion does to the fabric of space and time. It may be simply illustrated by an analogy that I often use to describe it. Imagine taking an empty aluminum soda can and wringing it in both hands like a dish rag. This counter-rotating motion will spiral and fold, fold and pleat the can, drawing its ends closer together. In this illustration, the can represents space-time itself, and the spiraling is what torsion does to it. The sun thus becomes, in Kozarev's model, a massive torsion machine, for in the rotation of its hot thermonuclear plasma, it functions as a gate, transducing the energies of the geometry of local space, the very geometries caused by the variations in planetary positions. Another analogy will help in understanding what Kozareb is hypothesizing. If we imagine each planet as representing one of our empty soda cans, each spiraling, folding, and pleating space-time in its own unique way and giving off spiraling waves of this energy, eventually these waves will overlap in an ever-changing pattern like rocks thrown into the surface of a calm pond. The effect of so many torsion systems overlapping each other is called dynamic torsion. Though there is one important difference between it and our example of rocks thrown into a calm pond, and that is that the motions of the planets are entirely predictable and therefore, at least theoretically, the mutual influences of dynamic torsion can be predicted with experimental observation being conducted to formulate the laws that would allow such predictions. Hence why we have such a fascination with the stars, the positions of the planets, astrology, why it's a cult, why it's connected to alchemy, and even these megalithic structures, because we're told these megalithic structures are built in alignment with the planets, with the positions of the stars. So clearly this is something uh, huge that, you know, maybe the hydrogen bomb accidentally tapped into, purposely tapped into. I know there's a lot of research that shows the areas where they blew up. These bombs are kind of interesting and specific and have their own anomalies. But you have a, a picture here of a, of a pyramid with a Tesla coil mounted inside. What's the correlation? The, well, the, I, I wanted to put this up because there are many out there proposing this is exactly what the pyramids do amongst many other things, not only act as a sort of healing mechanism, but a mechanism that feeds energy off of certain constellations, certain uh, orbits of the solar system. And again, going back to this whole thing of, you know, the Tesla coil, the, the double helix, whatever you want to refer to it as the nine, the, the toroidal fields, it's got that exact same geometric shape that you were describing as you were reading it. So for those watching visually, I thought it would be a good way to sort of describe it. This is what many propose the pyramids do exactly as uh, you were just reading from the book right there. So it really makes you think when you type in, for example, here, pyramid Tesla coil, right? We now see, for example, orgone crystals, if I'm not mistaken, right. being used in this regard as well. Right? I actually have one right here on my desk. Oh, there you go. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> It's see again, the double helix time exposure, copper pyramid, this whole angle here has been, it's been proposed that again, the Egyptians amongst many other uh, societies use the pyramids as a healing mechanism to harness using light photons, which would again be substantiated by Dr. Eric Davis's teleportation report from 2003 and four that he wrote for the air force that could show that this in fact may be legitimate which also, again, substantiates the Hutchinson effect as well. I'm not saying uh, as factual proof, but as evidence to say, okay, these are all these different, you know, data points that are not connected, but we're all coming to the same conclusion, whether it's the, the, the shapes of it, the geometry, the knowledge of it. You see what I mean? Right. Yeah. No, I mean, this is, yeah. And without going too far, too much further into the grid of the gods, you know, it's absolutely connected to the hydrogen bomb. And, you know, obviously with this time 
correlation. There's something going on with the pyramids, with this time period, the 1940s. We know Roswell occurred, hence the connection to all the UFO stuff. But even the megaliths have connections to the stars. I mean, if you subscribe to Ancient Aliens, right? I mean, Ancient Aliens poses a lot of crazy theories on their show, some of which I subscribe to, some of which I don't, but there's a clear correlation there in modern times. You know, oftentimes people see UFOs around these sites. So right. who knows if it, maybe they're not operating in the same capacity that they used to, but if these ships are advanced enough, maybe there's some sort of technology that they're still tapping into that we just don't recognize in our modern day for some reason, even though we can, you know, go and stand on top of the pyramid, you know, we're not like flying away in a plasma vortex, but you know, maybe there's something going on a little on the subtle realm that they're able to connect to. Right. And I, I couldn't agree more. Like we see here, for example. I wanted to share my screen one more time here. We'll find, okay, so hold on. Let's jump to this right here. Dailymail.co.uk, a luxury boat that's perfect for high flyers. Mega, oh, a 490, almost 500 foot long super yacht. Blimp, a super yacht uh, come blimp that is designed to fly as well as sail is unveiled in futuristic concept. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. What did you just call it? A what blimp? <laughs> It's a super yacht dash come dash blimp. That's the that's the thing that the headline said. Uh, and I quote called Air Yacht. The extravagant vehicle has been revealed in detailed concept images by the Rome-based company Lazzarini Design Studio, which has not yet revealed how much it might cost. The dry carbon fiber structure can reach 60 knots with its, with its electric engines and two blimps, allowing it to fly, hover, and float on the water too. Air Yacht is not an airship for public transportation or touristic purposes. Rather, it is conceived for a private owner, according to the design firm. End quote. Interestingly enough, something like this was recently featured on the, James, the latest James Bond film, No Time to Die, where they were able to go from air to water. Again, you could say maybe transmedium, so to speak. So it's not like it's out of the realm of human ingenuity to do that. But the reason I bring this up is because, again, using electrical engines that seem to sort of bring together that concept of electromagnetic frequencies bringing forward a new era ushering in a new era of propulsion which in a way frightens me from the you know controlled narrative perspective but you know when you look at it from a big picture it, it, the question then becomes okay we got to start somewhere right so what we'll find here as well going back to tall-white-aliens.com actually no we didn't go here yet i think was titled the mystery of heavy elements in galactic cosmic rays. We'll see scientists have used data from the Southwest Research Institute led magnetospheric multi-scale mission MMS to explain the presence of energetic heavy elements in galactic cosmic rays or GCRs. The GCRs are composed of fast moving energetic particles, mostly hydrogen ions called protons, the lightest and most abundant elements in the universe. Scientists have long debated how trace amounts of heavy ions in GCRs are accelerated. Again, going back to these beings allegedly ionizing air pockets above different bases, so to speak. We'll find here, for example, that heavy ions are thought to be insensitive to an incoming shock wave because they are less abundant and the shock energy is overwhelmingly consumed by the preponderance of protons. We'll see here that classical view of how heavy ions behave under shock conditions is not always what we see in high resolution MMS observations of near earth space environments. All right. And we'll see here, we observed intense amplification of the magnetic field near the bow shock, a known property associated with strong shocks, such as supernova remnants. Again, supernovas, that whole angle of the spiral, the Fibonacci sequence. Going back to, I don't want to confuse people here. I want to make sure we're on the right, the toroid field that we were looking at. Please forgive me. Let me see here. Just so everyone gets the right visualization here. Yeah, here we go. The toroid field. So now if we head back to this right over here, while this behavior, and I quote, was not expected to occur for heavy ions, the team identified direct evidence of this process in alpha particles, helium ions that are four times more massive than protons and have twice the charge. End quote. So clearly hydrogen has a major, major factor in the way in which the military tries to take down these craft, the way in which these craft interact with the planet and not just our planet, but planets in our orbit when feeding off of energy, like with the sun that we saw. 
And they seem to do it, again, in correspondence with the, with the cosmic orbit. And it seems to be that the orbit of our planets is way more significant than anyone ever thought, which would then, you know, sort of reinforce or regurgitate that concept of we're just living in a cycle sort of clock. This is what we're experiencing now on this planet. This awakening psychologically and all these different things spiritually have happened to us before, you know, a species being hit on the head with amnesia. And in technically speaking, the toroid field and the infinity symbol as well, which again, the infinity symbol from, you know, ancient Egypt and all that lines up perfectly with the double helix, with the pyramid plasma energy. I mean, again, I'm not saying this is fact. I'm just saying, uh, just look at the similarities. I, I, again, to, to everyone, I encourage you all to decide for yourselves, right? So again, phase conjugation corroborates plasma, sorry, plasma intelligence from Mr. Dan Winter's work. And of course, not just his work, but Walter Russell's as well. Let's do a quick search of Walter Russell. Again, the spiral. Right. right. The toroidal field, the planets, like you said, you know, further substantiating the, 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 I get, I guess we could say at this point, the fact that the, that planets are alive in, in one way or another, again, just depending how you view it, which also corroborates, as I've mentioned on our Patreon and publicly the concentric circles where, for example, what I mean by that is not necessarily the Fibonacci sequence spiral that too, but that the spiral, when you look at the toroid field from above is actually doing exactly that which then creates, again, if you look at it from above, right, that spiral that keeps going in and then back out again, in and then back out again, right? Sort of like how our planet seems to be living too. It's just in a cyclical type way. So, and, and one, sorry, one final thing I wanted to mention was that with these concentric circles, it's been proposed that, again, what's been referred to as chaos, magic, or quantum entanglement can't always be substantiated every single time because it's been proposed in modern human history that the way we know to, we can prove something in science is if we experiment on it over and over and we get the same result. But what if we got to change our perception about that with respects to quantum entanglement? Because chaos magic refers to certain magical instances that only occur within a certain context of that event happening. And so we call it magic because science can't, we can't explain it scientifically. What if we could explain it scientifically but we need to, again, our consciousnesses need to, I don't want to be overly vague here, but need to ascend to a level of understanding relative to the cosmic orbit of our solar system because it is the age of Aquarius that could be represented visually with Walter Russell, Dan Winter, Fibonacci sequence, whatever, toroid fields. Sorry if I lost you there or if I went on a ramp. Oh, no, I'm just, I, can you elaborate on the Aquarian connection? Because I think that's absolutely fascinating. Sure. Well, I, I will tell you first and foremost, uh, people like uh, a friend, uh, our friends, Ani and Micah know way more than I do with that stuff. So I'm not going to pretend like I'm big into astrology, you know, ast uh, astrology and all that, but apparently age of Aquarius, and this is not the first time to has happened to our species that when the age of Aquarius occurs, people all over the planet just begin to enlighten. There is a frequent wave of densification that's sort of been lifted and people just start to notice more things. People start to say, wait a minute, you know, for example, why am I doing this, you know, they start to question their lives in a beneficial way, right? Why am I going to this nine to five job? Why is this happening? Why is this happening the way the government says it is? You know, I, this is going to be a YouTube episode. So I, at least on my end, I don't want to get into what's happening in the world right now in case we get removed, but you know what I mean, right? Right. That whole people waking up going, hold on, do I need to take this beep boop? Do I, you know what I mean? Like all these different things, people questioning what is exactly, what are the elites doing that they claim to you know no way better than us that we don't people are realizing these are cheap parlor tricks you know looking at the Ghislaine Maxwell trial people are saying this is total nonsense just the overall angle of wait a minute we're being we're being played we're under a facade of sorts right so again not for me to say what direction we as a species may or may not be going in but I mean yeah no it's all very pressing and uh, I I agree. And, you know, that's why we put our stuff out on YouTube, but I definitely don't hinge any of my bets on YouTube. I, I'm really grateful to be on Rockfin to do content like this. But if anyone is listening on Rockfin, because my show goes out on, or I'm sorry, on YouTube, my show goes out audio only on YouTube. 
come on over to the podcasting sphere because there's a certain element I found with this content through the podcast that it just synchronistically fits. So you might have found this show by accident. You might have found it for a reason. Maybe there's a big reason. And I'm thinking what we can do with this show that might be really cool is to start a Telegram group for people who are specifically fans of this series, specifically people who are interested in participating in the research. Because I think what's kind of been happening lately is, you know, we'll do an episode and during the episode, I'll be like, you know what, I think next week we're going to talk about this, right? So I think this week we'll go into helium considering, you know, it kind of touched on some things in this episode. And then maybe we can also start like touching on elements that don't have as much to say about like un unpentium. So maybe we'll do next week's ep or not next week, but next time we get together, we'll do uh, an episode on those two elements. And in the meantime, we'll start a telegram chat. So everybody listening right now, whether on YouTube, Rockfin, the podcasting, sign up for our telegram for the elemental philosophy forum and participate in the conversation, you know, whether you're there to add some research, whether you're there to just say what up and, and talk to me, Dave's very busy. So I don't know, maybe Dave will chime in every now and then, but I'll definitely keep my eye on it and I'll, be posting stuff in there that we touch on on the show and i definitely want you to send me some of those images that you have in your tabs there maybe for the for the artwork for the audio listeners so they can see it while they're listening but uh, here we are brother i think this series is you know what are we seven episodes in now and and we're doing pretty good dude i like the way it's going i like where it's heading and i definitely think that you know like i was saying before we started recording we can maybe open this up maybe to guest maybe we get someone like dan winter on the show who knows a thing or two about this type of thing and this the element we pick fits into their work or maybe you know a podcaster who has their own podcast is listening right now and you want to be a part of this hit me up by all means whether i know you or not maybe somebody out there who's in alt media united maybe somebody out there who i've done a podcast with if you're listening, you have your own podcast and you've done this before, you have all the equipment ready, hit us up because we could definitely use a third position, a third perspective in this conversation. I think magic happens in threes. Not to say that the, this episode and our episode on lithium weren't great, but you know there is a certain magic uh, when you have three people together that I enjoy. And that's why I really enjoy doing this show. So... Yeah, opening that up. I mean, I hope you're cool with that, Dave, that I kind of just threw that out there right here for everyone to listen to. But uh, Abs Oh, no, Mark, I'm extremely upset. I would not have <laughs> the things you just said. <laughs> no, no, just kidding. I, absolutely, absolutely. I'm all for it, whether it's Mr. Winter or whether it's, I will actually ask him as well, or whether it's any individual that is, you know, has a background in science or not that wants to, you know, if any of you folks listening or watching really want to jump in again, like Mark said, we're, now we got a very comfortable rhythm going with this series, so we can now comfortably say, you know, again, we've sort of got a good vibe for what you folks out there like, and we've taken in a lot of the constructive criticism, and we'd be more than happy to either have someone come on to, you know, again, debate the science of it or the certain elements of it, whether it's the esoteric angle, the scientific angle, or even to, to just add to what we have, whether it's a healthy skeptical debate or, again, someone just helping to corroborate what we're finding. Uh, I'm all for it. One, uh, one trillion percent. Absolutely. Yeah, me too, man. And that's why obviously I said that, but also I really enjoy meeting and speaking with the people, especially through telegram that listen to the show. It's just a really cool aspect that you all are out there participating. And I remember when I was a podcast listener, I definitely enjoyed being in the little communities that I was in for various shows like Gramerica and tinfoil hat slightly but here we are now starting our own group of cool badass friends i don't feel like the episode's totally done with yet i feel like i cut you off maybe you have some more to add but i have sort of something that relates in a weird way i do want to i did want to save this for the end because it's kind of like i don't know it, it's 
its speculative spiritualists' perspective on hydrogen, but I think it's interesting the occult significance of it. Absolutely. All right, so I'll I'll share my screen and just make sure my Oh shoot. Got to fix the rock fin. Sorry for the dead air here, folks. No problem at all, though. Okay, so we got this up. So in the 1800s, early 1900s, there were a lot of folks moving and shaking around called the Theosophists and the Spiritualists, right? And these people were pretty famous for doing seances and whatnot. And there are a couple famous Theosophists that people learn about when they learn about the occult. H.P. Blavatsky is probably the most famous. There are many others and a lot of authors who you might not realize were Theosophists. Frank Baum, the writer of The Wizard of Oz, is one of those. But I found this article on spellsandmagic.org, which is why I kind of saved it for the end. But cult chemistry is a category that they have on their site. And I'm like, oh, that's really fascinating. Let's check this out. And I shared these links with you in that little telegram that you and I have. But yeah, it was interesting that in this time, let's see, 1895, this appeared in a pamphlet called Lucifer. And then again in a separate pamphlet in 1905. And it's basically sort of a spiritualist metaphysical interpretation of hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. And they were clairvoyantly examined and then presented in these pamphlets. And the person behind it was someone who's semi-famous, not as famous as Blavatsky. Their name is... Um, Leadbeater. I, I think it's Charles Leadbeater, but I could be wrong on the first name there. But either way, Leadbeater and I think Annie Besant, who's also another famous. Sorry, brother, could, could you just uh, stop scrolling for a second? I just wanted to read this one part caught my attention, um, it, if that's OK. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, and I quote, the physical world is regarded 1895 as being composed of between 60 and 70 chemical elements aggregated into an infinite variety of combinations. These combinations fall under the three main heads of solids, liquids, and gases, the recognized substates of physical matter. With the theoretical ether, ether of space, scarcely admitted as material, it would not be allowed by scientists that gold could be raised to the etheric condition as it might be to the liquid and gaseous. The clairvoyant number two finds that the gaseous is succeeded by the etheric state as the solid is succeeded by the liquid. End quote. The reason I wanted to bring this up is because 1895 seems quite peculiar relative to the timeline of when Hitler and the Nazis began to form with the Thule oh, yeah. Society, the Vril Society, and then again having to do with, you know, that, that chemical Vril, that uh, sort of, you know, using different types of liquids, if you will, in plasma to make the craft propel itself. And again, using very depraved, alleged, alleged, I say, depraved sexual practices to create what I was referring to about 20 minutes ago in with respects to quantum entanglement and chaos magic. Right. With, to create certain instances that only occur within that particular context of the esoteric intention. So right. it's not like you can just simply repeat that action at, at, at anywhere in the world and it'll occur. You see what I mean? Yeah. And what's interesting about that is the, you know, SS and the Thule Society and all the different cult sort of forces within that group of people that Hitler had working for him, but all the other German groups that came before that, that kind of assimilated into or left Germany during that time. But they were all very much a part of this kind of theosophic movement. I mean, the, all the people that were part of it in America, I mean, they, they were, I mean, not too far removed generations wise from their European roots, right? So they took a lot of that stuff with them from Europe. But this is, yeah, absolutely a part of it. And I'm sure that group of people, the Thule Society, have much more clairvoyant, you know, looks into this sort of thing. But it is, yeah, it is interesting how they got some things wrong, but they definitely were right about things that you might be like, well, how would they know this at this time? I mean, maybe they could have been you know, in a, in a college library and found some obscure or new 
chemistry information or whatever, you know, they could have, they could have been up on like some of this stuff and, and just faked it all and pretended like they clairvoyantly made it up. But again, you know, I give, I give all those clarifications just so people know that I'm skeptical about it, but I'm not afraid to dive into it and think maybe this is true. So anyways, they, they talk about the nature of hydrogen and yeah, I don't know. Can, can I also mention here, and it's, we see here, if you scroll up a little bit, the first thing that happens on removing a gaseous atom from its hole or encircling wall is that the contained bodies are set free and evidence evidently released from tremendous pressure, assume physical spheric or spherical or ovoid forms. Okay. You see here the whole or encircling wall, again, Fibonacci sequence, the Tesla coil, the, right. he, the double helix, the toroid toroid field it's the it's the same consistency in a visual sense and even in a descriptive sense it just trying to describe it it's the same thing over and over again right so again if i could share my screen real quick i don't uh, to be honest i don't have much more to add after this but whether it's walter russell you know nickel the tesla coil walter russell brought the pages of it brought his whole book to to, to nikola tesla and tesla said look you got to put it away humanity's not ready as we know here, for example, and I, to quote Mr. Russell, genius awaits him who listens. The messages of genius are for the soul of man. The senses of man comprehend them not. End quote. Right. So again, I, I personally, I'd like to, uh, at least on my end, I'd, I'd uh, probably finish or wrap up at least uh, my, my end of things in, the, in that regard, because I can't help but think that that's a great way to sort of, you know, bring it full circle, no pun intended. <laughs> yeah, right on. Yeah. And like I said, you know, people definitely, if you're enjoying the series, sign up in the telegram, the link will be in the description. And, uh, yeah, if you're down to participate, hit one of us up, We're not hard to find. And that about does it for me, brother, Instagram, my family thinks I'm crazy.com, altmediaunited.com, all the places. Thank you so much. Appreciate diving through the periodic table of elements with you. And yeah, hopefully someone uh, new will join us next week and we'll see what happens with, with the chemistry there. No pun intended. And for your audience, if it's cool on your end on Rockfin or audio or YouTube, uh, at podcast Z on Twitter, a generation Z podcast, no space or capitals on Instagram, patreon.com slash generation Z. And of course, just type in Generation Z Podcast on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or Podbean, and we are we're all there. So thank you so very much, everybody. Mark, as per usual, it's been a it's been a blast, and we'll catch you all for the next episode. Cheers. Cheers.